why do people reject the gospel and how does this tie in with free will and predestination obviously if you were to ask different kinds of people you'll get a variety of, of different answers one of the most common answers that i've heard from free will free grace um, or at least the the all-encompassing reason i guess that the envelopes a subset of other reasons is pride that people are too prideful to accept the free gift or that people are too prideful to let go of their works or too prideful to acknowledge that they're not a good person and give up their religious tradition or whatever it might be and i'm not in any way saying that that's wrong i think from from observation you could say that that's true but i do have a sort of problem with this answer as well because if we understand that salvation is not of ourselves and there's none good but god well the flip side is to say that we are saved because we are more humble than them and that's the problem when we say thank you lord that i'm not like this pharisee because then we've moved back we've moved from the back of the temple to the front of the temple alongside the pharisee right if we go down that route so pride is a legitimate reason from an outside perspective but i think it's quite a superficial reason to some extent when i've talked about the issue of whether we really have free will and i explained that unsaved people are spiritually blind they love darkness rather than light and the truth is foolishness to them well a lot of christians mostly the legalists and the johnny fruit inspectors as some of you like to call them severely misunderstand the tree and the fruit illustration of course they mainly focus on the fruit you've got to bring forth good fruit you've got to repent of your sins and clean up your acts and do the works and so on and it's almost as if what they're trying to do is correct the fruit of the tree rather than the tree itself but jesus on the other hand says make the tree good because a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit at all and vice versa and so what we perceive to be pride i'd say is more of a symptom of the tree because the tree is already corrupt and the problem with lumping it under pride is that pride is a matter of perspective because from an unsaved person's point of view from someone who believes in work salvation they actually think that you're the prideful one by not turning from your sins to be saved okay so example i've got a couple of examples so example number one our camp of people people that teach grace and, and so on we're very dogmatic aren't we and that's why we have all of these fights that go on between greg jackson and jack smack and daniel perez and mike sandpat uh, truth speller destroying the works of the devil and so on there's all these arguments and fallouts that happen fallouts about rewards about free will about chastisement and this doctrine and that doctrine and the whole hyper grace stuff as well because we are extremely dogmatic and very argumentative about what we believe and we're very judgmental and condemning condescending towards people that we don't agree with particularly on the works issue so to a lot of christians and even non-christians they think you're prideful okay they think it's prideful of you to think that you're the only carriers of the true religion when liberal christians and eastern religions are so much more tolerant of different belief systems they think it's prideful that i think all of these great renowned men of god like ray comfort and john MacArthur, are all wrong and the small band of other right they think that's prideful and i you know i this insignificant person you know i think i'm right so as a matter of perspective you say they're prideful but they think exactly the same about you another example so this is these people who say that we need to repent of our sins to be saved and they love to brag about having turned from all of their sins and they think uh, you know we think they're the most arrogant people on the planet for saying that and we would base that on the story of the pharisee at the front and the publican at the back uh, or something like that but these repent of sins guys they could just as easily pull out second chronicles 7 14 and throw that at you because it says if my people who are called by my name 
shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. So those guys could show you that verse where the Bible actually equates turning from your wicked ways with humbling yourself. So if you don't turn from your wicked ways, if you don't repent of sins, you're not being humble, you're being prideful in that regard. So again, as I say, pride is a matter of perspective. And my video on repentance from Ezekiel does sort of resolve that, that point in terms of your righteousness and not establishing your own righteousness in regards to salvation, the whole repent of sins issue. Now, the misunderstanding that free will Freddies often have Maybe not so much grace believers, because they, they understand the concepts of the reprobate mind and so on, but a lot of the, you know Christians like the Catholics and the Protestants, the free will Freddies in, in that camp, they have this mistaken idea that if we can bombard the same people over and over and over again with powerful counter-arguments to try and apologetically resolve all of their hang-ups about the gospel, we might eventually win them over. Unfortunately, though, that's not how it works, because when people reject the gospel message, they're not just rejecting your presentation of it, they're rejecting the words of the power of the Spirit of God himself, because it's his power that saves, and it's his Spirit that gave the words that we preach the gospel with, like whosoever believes, and so on. And if it can be said that God gave them up, and God gave them over, as it says in Romans 1. Well, if God already gave them up, I'm not really sure what you think you're going to be able to do for them, to be quite frank. And when someone gives you an endless list of reasons why they just won't take the free gift without arguing about it, you know, that's the best insurance, life insurance policy you could have, and it's free. They're not asking you to improve your sales pitch or haggle a better deal, because you can't get a better deal than a free gift. Rather, these excuses that they give, you know, I don't believe in the gospel because of this reason, or I reject the free gift because James 2 or whatever it might be. What they're actually trying to do is to justify and vindicate their already preconceived rejection of the free gift. So, the moment you take them to task on their reasons why, in a lot of people, you may trigger something called cognitive dissonance, dissonance which is exactly what, when, we, when I've been out soul winning with brother, brother James, like the amount of people he talks to, and you just see on the face, like the cognitive dissonance just, just kicks in, and the, like panic mode, because everything they thought they believed has just been turned on its head by James, you know, wicker the Bible out. So... They go into this panic mode and they'll run into the, the next best excuse that they've got or the next misappropriated Bible verse like somewhere in James 2 or they want to hide behind whatever. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So an atheist might object to believing on Christ and he might give you a list of scientific reasons of some kind or historical reasons for his scepticism that maybe, you know, Jesus never existed or something like that. Now, if you're really sharp, and you really know your stuff, and you're quick on your feet, you might actually be able to refute whatever he said, and show that their own logic doesn't actually stand to reason. But then what happens is, when you do that, you know, it might be that maybe something he thought about science was wrong, or he thought something about the history was wrong, and you confront him about it, well then what he'll do is, he'll move the goalpost, and he'll say something like, well, even if God was real, I still wouldn't worship him because he's a malicious, tyrannical dictator and the Bible condones rape and slavery, which he doesn't, by the way, that's just a common misconception. But even when you refute that, they'll just find something else. Or they'll, they'll just invent something else, like they'll say that God raped a 12-year-old because of the Virgin Mary story and so on. Even though the Bible never actually mentions a rage and it's all completely conjecture, and they know it's conjecture, but they just choose to pick the lowest, you know, age, and then just say that you're making excuses, basically. Because the moment they go there and bring that stuff out, they're imme they've immediately turned all of the science into a red herring. Because if you're going to say that God is this and God is that, and 
how dare we follow a religion that believes in such a god? Well then, it's not actually about the science, is it? The science is not relevant. It's irrelevant what radi radiometric dating says, or the fossil record tells, tells us, because whether we can prove that God exists or not makes no difference whatsoever, does it? It, it makes no difference to the price of fish. So what he's actually doing is, it's not about the science, he's actually looking for his excuses as to why he hates God, because he hates God's laws, he hates his holiness, he hates his righteousness. And the reason why he likes his science so much is that it's easier to hide behind because science doesn't have any moral implications to it. He can hide behind his safety net of, oh, well, there's just nothing to convince me, rather than the moral implications of saying that you hate God or that God's a monster. Because if they want to battle against the righteousness of God, well, God's got plenty of things to say back to that wicked sinner who probably called a mon God a monster for killing the firstborn of Egypt, yet, surprise, same hypocrite probably thinks that abortion's fine, usually. That's often what ends up being the case. And God's the one who's in charge of heaven and hell, lest we forget. So, that's one example, but obviously from a Christian perspective, picking on atheists in that regard is an easy target. So what about the works-based Christians? Well, obviously, given that my content is targeted towards people that already name the name of Christ, and I've done a lot of stuff on the repentance issue, so I'm a little bit more accustomed to dealing with them anyway. And I'm sure that a lot of my regular viewers know the drill. If you've not heard it said on my channel, you've heard it somewhere else. You know, people say things like, you can't just believe, otherwise somebody could just sin and get away with it. Or, you sound like you sound like Satan telling Eve, you shall not surely die. You know, these are often the sort of the strawman arguments that are thrown against us. But of course two people can play that game because they sound like Satan. We can just say that they sound like Satan telling Eve, ye have God said. And even when we've gone to great lengths to explain Jesus' unpluckable hand and how the context is about eternal life, all they can say for themselves is, well, you can still walk away though. You have the free will to walk away from the shepherd and forfeit your everlasting life. Well, you don't have to have a particularly high IQ to figure out that that's not actually how shepherding works. Shepherds don't just let sheep wander off. Sheep are property. And if you were a professing shepherd, but then you let your sheep go off wherever they want and don't try and bring them back, well, you're not an employable shepherd. You're largely incompetent. And if you were the owner of the sheep, you would have gone out of business by the end of the week. And so then when you press them into that corner, they come out with the old excuse, well, in that model, people could just do whatever they want and still get away with it. You know, boo-hoo, cry me a river. Or another thing they do is, you, you will completely demolish their false understanding of scripture. And I've noticed this a lot, that in, instead of going back to that passage where I've proven them wrong, even if it's a passage that they actually brought up, and they, they won't go back to that passage to tell me why I'm wrong about that passage. Instead, what they'll do is they'll run off to a different passage or a completely different topic and try and change the conversation so that they can pretend that you didn't say what you just said and that you didn't just refute what they believe by that passage. They, they just run away from it. It's like a game of scriptural cat and mouse. Or verse hopping is another term. All that to say that, all that to say this, unfortunately, most people are not as hungry for the truth as we would like them to be. There's a lot of people in what's known as the, the truth seeker movement, where they're in, into all of the conspiracy theories and exposing science, they fo so, science falsely so-called, being sceptical of anything that involves the government. But unfortunately, in all of that truth seeking, they still won't ever come to the knowledge of the truth. They still won't believe the gospel. There's a lot of Christians in this world who don't study the Bible and haven't got a clue what New Testament Christianity looks like. And on the flip side, there's a lot of Christians who do read the Bible over and over again and know it inside out, who think that they're going to heaven because they're so much more righteous than everyone else. They're called Roman Catholics and Lordshippers, praying and asking God to save them and yet they still reject the gospel that would save them, so their prayers go unanswered. 
And ultimately it comes down to a very simple point when I talked about free will and whether we absolutely have it. By default, men love darkness rather than light, and that's why he has his fables and his merit-based salvation. That's why he cares more about the football score than the Bible. Yet he still wants to use James 2 and Matthew 25 in many cases as his insurance policy. The gospel is foolishness to these people. That's why they reject it. And I think even well-intentioned free will Freddies who are saved underestimate just how blind and spiritually retarded and foolish these unsaved people are, really. And, and, and we have to be careful because we were like that once. Okay, let's be forget. And that's why salvation is the, the work of God in that sense. Because that intensity of moron needs supernatural intervention to knock some sense into it. Okay. And so I hope that kind of answers the question. Looking back, uh, I do wonder if people think I've done a lot of talking and maybe not clearly answered some of these questions and the format is obviously a bit different to most of my content. But understand that we're not meant to know everything about everything. All right. If the Bible doesn't directly say they do this because of free will or they do this because of this, that, and the other, we don't, I don't think we need to sit there navel gazing trying to figure it out. You know, if, if the Bible doesn't tell me directly, I'm not really that worried about it, to be honest. And, you know, maybe you think I haven't answered some of these questions sufficiently in these videos, but understand that I'm not the oracle of Christianity, okay? I can't have the exact answers to all of life's difficult questions. This is just a, it's a very complex subject. 